fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back to the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm Al Warren. Keb Thompson is still out sick. Now, uh, today we have a returning guest, as well as uh, a guest of someone that he uh, helped write a book about. So, uh, Ken Klonsky is the author, and our other guest is David McCullum. Um, he wrote the book Freeing David McCullum. Um, thanks for being here, Ken. Hi, hi, Al. Hey, and David McCullum, thank you for being on the show. Wow, well, thanks, Al. Thanks for having me. That's great. Wow. So uh, that's quite quite the life you've lived, uh, David. So um, let's talk about what happened to you and uh, what was your experience when you're – it was when you were 16 years old, if I'm right. And, yes, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, and you and a friend of yours, uh, what was it, Willie Stuckley, uh, were – I guess arrested and charged with the killing of um, what Nathan Blenner. So uh, this is 1985. So take us back there and wh what you were doing in the area, and um, how this how this happened to get you arrested. So all about the time of October 19, 20, 19, uh, October 27, 1985. Um, I was simply doing what I just teenagers in my particular community did was kind of hang out around games game rooms with my family, I mean, you know, with my friends and so forth, you know, so just doing typical teenager things, like hanging out in the game rooms and playing with my friends and that sort of thing. So during that particular time, I can remember, you know, distinctively, that's exactly what I was doing, because that's what most kids in my neighborhood actually did, you know, at that time. So yeah, I remember that very vividly. Yeah, yeah. And this is New York you were living in, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. So how did you know the uh, guy, the uh, victim, Nathan Blenner at all? No, I did not. So, what what drew the police to you? Well, I, I would assume um, you know it was based on two individuals, two older individuals in my neighborhood who were known to um, you know commit crimes um, in and around New York New York City area, particularly in the Queens area. So when they they I guess committed a crime in Queens and was eventually arrested for it. Um, that is, uh, during that time that, you know, the case was being investigated, the case of Nathan Blenner's death was being investigated, um, they, I guess it was asked questions about who they may or may not know in the neighborhood, you know, who may know something about, or may who even, who even been involved in the case. Um, so the name Willie Stuckey came up at that particular time, and that's what led them to Willie Stuckey, which eventually did, did you know, to my arrest. And so so you and, you and, and uh, Willie were pretty good friends then, or...? No, yes, we were. We were really good friends. Um, we were around the same age, obviously, and uh, we went to the same school, for example, and, you know, uh, yeah, we were really pretty good friends then, yes. Yeah. So uh, when you when you first got questioned for this, um, it must have really surprised you. Well, actually, yeah, absolutely. I was actually shocked at the time because I knew um, the fact that I was being accused of committing a crime that I didn't commit. And the you know being accused of committing a crime of murder, which I have never done in my entire life, I was I was stunned and, and disbelieved because I knew um, based on the circumstances in terms of what the detectives were explaining, what the police were explaining to me about when and when this crime occurred, all this kind of different thing. Knowing first of all that they didn't commit the crime, but also knowing that when they said that the, the time that this crime was being committed it was said to be being committed. Um, I was actually from well else in New York City during the time, so I actually had a legitimate alibi defense, at least in my opinion. And um, you know, unfortunately, that you know, of course, didn't bear out in court later on. But that's exactly what I was doing. I was actually someplace else in New York City, you know, when this crime was said to have been committed. 
Okay, so so how did it get to where you confessed and falsely? Well, yeah, so what happened in this particular case is once Willie Stuckey, of course, was arrested on October 27, 1985, around, I would say, 7.30 p.m., um, he was taken down to the police station and asked about this crime. So as he's being interrogated about this crime, Mr. Stuckey, that is, he said that he was actually with me when this crime was said to have been committed. And as a result, that's what led the police to uh, eventually arrest me. But prior to Willie Stuckey, um, during the Willie Stuckey interrogation, um, he would say details about the crime in terms of how this crime was supposed to have been committed. And he sort of just sort of repeated some of the things that the police officers told him during their, I guess, you know, during their investigation. And as a result, he was actually forced to make a confession implicating me as actually a shooter in the crime. Wow. So, so what what was your place in this then when you um when you heard this and stuff so did you just go along with the confession then or no actually i did not um when i actually heard and you know in terms of what the the police officer detect i uh, guess at the time uh, police officer Joseph Buddha was explaining to me, I already knew that I could commit a crime. And I actually knew that Willie Stuckey didn't commit a crime, too, because, again, um, during the time that they said this crime was said that they committed, we, Willie Stuckey and I both was actually in the same area, you know, during the time of this supposedly crime, you know, at the time it was committed. So I already knew that, what you know, this information was, I guess, false, you know? Yeah. And, and so... Did you did what what kind of help did you have? Um, did you have a lawyer at the time? Well, initially, no. I think in New York City, what happens in New York City is when you can't afford an attorney, which I was clearly in that particular situation, couldn't afford a uh, you know an attorney. Okay. I was assigned a court appointed attorney. Yes. Yeah, and and so you actually got brought to trial, and got convicted of the crime. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. I was actually convicted of all the the, the, the crime of murder in the second degree, and of course the um, the adjoining offenses that I was actually charged and actually convicted of too. Yes, it was eventually you know sentenced to twenty five years to life in prison. Wow! And so, how long did you actually spend in prison totally? Well, I spent a total of twenty nine years. Well, actually, to be more frank, I spent actually uh, approximately twenty eight and a half years in prison on the ground. Wow, and so uh, now, now that um, it, it's all happened and passed, uh, did you ever think that you were going to get out? Like, is this kind of you? Th did you just put yourself as being in there for the rest of your life, or? Well, initially, and for a long time, perhaps I, you know, leaned on the fact that my mom was a very positive person, but at the same time, I knew, at least in the back of my mind, that it was a distinct possibility that I could actually spend the rest of my life in prison if things don't go the way I expected them to go. So there were times, and I will say many times over the course of 20 and a half years, that I actually thought that I would spend the rest of my life in prison, yes. So how did you um, um, get out in a sense of what, what, what was the first moves that happened for you that was going to lead you out of prison? Well, for me, first of all, like, you know, during, in New York State, you afford the right to appeal your particular case, you know, after conviction. So when my state and federal appeals were exhausted, I would say in 1993, what I decided to do is write a letter writing campaign. And during that letter writing campaign, I decided to write various people. So whether, whether it be, you know, news agencies, uh, various news media outlets, and that sort of thing. So once I was able to do that, and I would say I wrote approximately 600 plus letters in that particular case. So, for example, some cases I would write, let's say the Daily News, I would write law firms, and I would write them more than once. I would write them maybe once, twice, three, four times, if need be, because, you know, in my, my particular situation, I was not willing to take no for an answer, so I was willing to force the issue at least as best as I could. But I wanted to explore every opportunity and every option I could under my circumstances. So what happened was once my, um, you know, state, again, state and federal appeals were exhausted, I was, uh, began this letter writing campaign. And this letter writing campaign lasted for a number of years, obviously, and which eventually led me to my first, uh, a magazine that I was actually reading in prison called The Sun. And in The Sun magazine, I, read, I came across an inter interview um, with Ken Konsky and Ruben Hurricane Carter. So, of course, I knew who Ruben was, you know, being a former prize fighter and that sort of thing and having spent a number of years in prison himself for a crime he didn't commit in, you know, Paris, New Jersey. 
So, you know, what happened was I decided to write the Sun magazine an article and letter letting let them know because I'm letting get in contact with Ruben. You know, so what they said to me was, look, well, well, we can't give you um, his personal contact information. What we can do is we can forward to letter on to Mr. Kofsky, which I assume they was which I assume they did. And once they did that, Mr. Kofsky wrote me back about let's say a week and we can have later on letting me know that, you know, he was touched by my letter and, and some of the things I had to say and you know, once he was able to do that and I was able to communicate with Ken on a number of levels, Ken said that he would, you know, um, you know, forward my letter on to Ruben to see what, how he would, you know, accept the letter, and which he did. So once that process took place, uh, eventually what led to that is uh, a communication with Ruben, you know, and, of course, uh, the case uh, sort of sort of catapulted from there. Before you came across um, Ken Klonsky, what was the type of reactions you were getting from people that you were writing letters to? Well, in New York State, for example, this is very typical of New York State. So I was getting, for say, for example, law firms. I'm um, with well, Mr. McCallum. You know, we we understand your situation. We we hear what you're saying, but unfortunately, we don't have the resources to take upon your take on your case right now. And you know, uh, initially, I was very upset about that particular response because I felt like people were not being totally honest with me about that. But at the same time, I understood because not only someone like me who are writing letters you know, day in and day out. I'm sure there were many other uh, inmates in prison who were writing letters to these particular firms and agencies as well. So it was very, very difficult for me to take, and I, I clearly understood that. But at the same time, you know, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. So when I eventually, um, you know, started making adjustments in my responses and sort of sort of maturing that particular level, I decided to just say, you know what, I'm going to continue to move on. Um, no is no, but I have to take no as a yes which means it, it inspired me to continue to fight for what I ultimately believed in, which is the innocence of Willie Stucky and I. That's pretty amazing to have that kind of, uh, uh, how do you say, get up and go, like to keep on going, because um, you've got to have a lot of, um, there's a lot of rejection involved in this. Oh, no, no question. I mean, look, when you write over, let's say, 600 plus letters or so, uh, you know, on a, on a, let's say a daily basis, um, when you're being told no, it, it hurts. It hurts. But at the same time, and then again, initially I struggled with the answer no, the response no, I really struggled with that. But then I started to understand, look, you know, okay, look, everybody's not going to be what you expect them to be. So what can I do differently during the course of my maturation and writing letters? What can I say differently or how can I compose my letters differently to help people understand my plight. And as time went on, I think I made adjustments to my particular letters, and, and look, not that I was being untruthful prior to, but I felt like I needed to make adjustments and maybe I wasn't conveying my message clear enough. So I started looking at myself, too, in terms of what I could and couldn't do and in terms of what I could not and wouldn't say to people. Because at the very end, and at the very, I just wanted to be totally honest if whoever read any of my letters, I wanted to be totally upfront with them about everything because in my position, I felt like I had nothing to hide. So I wanted to be totally honest with everybody in that particular situation. And I felt like I was. And I was really satisfied with my letters, even though, for the most part, um, I was told no. I felt okay with that only because I knew that I was being totally upfront with everything that I had to share with them. Yeah, yeah. I just I could just imagine the uh, overall. It would be very very um, negative toward uh, overall. It would be a down sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, now now Ken, um, from your point, um, how did you first get um, involved in the case? As David said, he wrote a letter to me. Um, I was. Uh, at that point with uh, Reuben Carter, uh, and he was uh, on the verge of leaving the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. And so when I got this letter, uh, I sent it over to Reuben and I asked him what he felt uh, in terms of David, because Reuben had worked with, uh, oh, I mean, at least 20 exonerations. He, he had uh, an enormously successful record in Canada, and uh, this was a U.S. case. It wasn't his first U.S. case by any means, but um, uh, this would have been his first case that he um, initiated, 
And so he read David's letter, and he was um, intrigued by it. And he felt like we needed to uh, meet David and make some kind of decision uh, based on uh, the way he felt about him. It wasn't simply that Reuben would pick up a case out of nowhere uh, it, because he felt like the person was innocent. Innocence was half the issue. The other half was character. Reuben didn't want to represent somebody who might come out of prison and uh, because he's been destroyed or uh, ruined in some way by having been inside the prison, come out and commit a crime, even though that person was innocent of the original crime. So Reuben had to know and feel that David was somebody who would represent the wrongly convicted. And not, again, when a wrongly convicted person comes out and commits another crime, uh, it, it, it's a serious matter. It doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen, it uh, discredits a lot of other wrongly convicted people. So that's where I got involved um, in assessing whether Reuben would be willing to work with David. Now, now from that point, and uh, and you guys decide to meet um, David, and you guys decide that it's it's a case that you would take on. Uh, What's involved with that? Like, what, what is it that you guys do at that point? We have to look at the case, and David is, uh, was uh, spectacularly organized. Uh, he had um, materials uh, that were uh, date-sensitive and um, uh, trial transcripts, police reports, and you have to go through every page of the trial transcripts and the police reports. Those are the main documents that you're dealing with. Uh, and uh, so I would say it took us close to a year to really feel like we even knew half of that trial transcript because every time you read it, and even now, here we are, uh, David's been out of prison now for three and a half years, even now I pick up uh, and occasionally I see a bit of the trial transcript and I say to myself, hmm, now that's something I don't remember. So there's a lot of stuff in a transcript that you don't see because you don't have the context. Uh, you can read the words, but you don't know how they're being played out in a courtroom. Uh, so that's why you need the police reports and the anecdotal stuff to put all of that together and make some kind of uh, alternative narrative to the one that was put forward that resulted in David and Willie's conviction. And I do want to say one thing. One of the reasons David and Willie were convicted was that in 1986, when the trial actually took place, there had been no real research done on uh, false confessions. Uh, as we were talking about with uh, Sebastian Burns and Atif Rafay the last time, uh, false confessions, even even in 2004, the, um, the judge wouldn't allow a uh, false confession expert into the courtroom. Now it's very common, but back in those days, back when you talk 1986, if some jury sees a person confess to a crime, no matter how, um, uh, no matter how far-fetched, the scenario is, and even if two people are confessing to the crime and have no relationship to each other in the way they describe it, the jury says, well, they say they did it. That's it. It's an open and shut case. We don't even have to look at the rest of the case. Yeah, so, so, yeah. What's the turning point for that? When, when can you um, get people on board with believing and false confessions or believing that it could happen. Because it's still, even though it's presentable today and we're talking about it more, I know I still get people that roll their eyes when I tell them about a case like this. There's still a lot of, um, I don't want to say fight, but there's still a lot of uh, kind of, yeah, right, kind of attitude. How could you confess? Like, how, how, do, we, how do we get people to believe that this happens? Well, first of all, people who say they would never confess 
to a crime they didn't do, haven't undergone police interrogation. Now, uh, let's say you're an adult and you know enough to get a lawyer, uh, because plenty of adults, all they do is sit there and tell the stories without even getting a lawyer there. Uh, but let's say you're an adult and you have some resources in terms of resisting pressure, but put yourself in the place of a pair of 16-year-old kids. The first thing a 16-year-old kid wants to do is get out of the police station. Uh, they, and, and so if they're told individually, well, David, you know, if you tell us what happened, and, and we know that Willie really was the shooter, and, and, and you just have to tell us what happened, then you'll go home. I mean, your mom is waiting for you at home. Uh, why wouldn't you just tell us and you can leave? And uh, all he needs to do is uh, start talking. And he says, well, uh, Willie is the guy who shot him and everything, and, and, and saying that he was there. As soon as you say you were there, then you're implicated. So you're not going home. And David didn't go home for 29 years. Yeah. Yeah, I, think, how it, yeah, I was going to say, I think that's probably it. Uh, uh, people just don't have the experience with the system to understand how a false confession can happen. No, they don't. Uh, uh, David, how do you, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about uh, people that say um, that they could never falsely confess for something they never did? Um, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, I think anytime someone you know has a so-called confession, um, the first inclination is that they're guilty, right? Right. Because if it's a public who's not necessarily an educator on this, on this particular issue, which is false confession, which is a, one of the leading, you know, uh, causes of, for, of wrongful conviction. So once someone says that they're guilty of a crime, albeit falsely, um, the first inclination is to say, well, you know what, if he didn't commit this crime, as Kim was just saying, if he, if he didn't commit this particular crime, why would he confess? But what doesn't happen and what doesn't occur in these particular situations is that what happens in the precinct when the cameras are not on, okay? And what happens in precincts when the cameras are not on is the physical altercations that occur in some cases, you know, the psychological abuse that occurs in cases, okay? For, so, for example, in New York State, they're allowed to get away with, so to speak. They're allowed to actually get away with letting you know or saying to you, an innocent suspect, a young suspect like myself and Willie Stuckey, is that someone said that you committed a crime. Okay? Right. So they, in other words, what they really do is they lead you into the confession, potentially, without having to justify the position as to how they got there. And that's what happens with young suspects like Willie Stuckey and I. We were hoodwinked for, or at least to some degree, into saying or believing and this is actually what happens. Notwithstanding, the reality of not what happened was Willie Stuckey and I didn't commit this particular crime. But when certain senses are read to you in which the way they are, along with the sort of psychological interrogation that occur, one would believe, especially doing a young suspects like Willie Stuckey and I, who were both 16 years old, we somehow lose track of what really happened so we substitute reality for a fallacy. But the fallacy is that we were promised also that if we confessed against the other in terms of one witnessing the crime of the other, we will be allowed to go home. So I think what the public has to rationalize is who, in their right state of mind, wouldn't say, for example, that Willie Stuckey or David McCallum um, – committed a crime in order to be released from incarceration or, you know, to be released confinement. And that's what happened. That's one of the other elements of this case that somehow sometimes gets lost in the, in the equation. And that's pretty sad, too, because that is the crux of why someone like Willie Stuckey and David McCallum was ultimately convicted of this particular crime. Now, now were you defended at all, at all? Like you said, you had a, um, 
you know, a paid for attorney. Did they just allow you guys to do these kind of confessions, or was this done beforehand? Well, I want to clarify one thing that you just mentioned. The attorneys were not paid for. Uh, they were what they call 18B attorneys. So, so for example, they were court-appointed attorneys. So um, their obligation, for the most part, at least in my opinion, of course I'm looking at this in hindsight, was not to investigate or not to defend this case in the best of their ability. It was defend, their, their position was to defend this case in the best of their ability. Right? right? And that means giving us the most adequate representation as required by the New York State Constitution. And which they out there did. But and when you deal with a murder case, for example, there's uh, so many different variables that are involved with this. Not, so, not, not, so, not only legal representation, but investigations, interviewing particular witnesses, going to the alibi witnesses, speaking to them, and those sorts of things. And those things were not really done in this particular case. You know? So, I think what happens is, um, when we look at ATB attorneys, for example, which I had an ATB attorney, Peter Murdo, we weren't given the sort of representation that I felt like this case deserved. And as a result, in the end, we also may pay for that. Yeah. Yeah, I could oh, add something. Yeah. First of all, David never met this attorney until the day of the trial. Uh, he was He was never... Uh, basically given any kind of uh, briefing the the attorney. The attorney himself was 71 years old. He had, oh, I think a half a dozen other similar serious cases, uh, all of which uh, I think the uh, district attorney knew they were going to win because he was such an incompetent lawyer. But uh, as well, he was under investigation during this time by the bar for stealing and lying to clients. After the trial, he was, in fact, disbarred. So this is an attorney who's representing a 16-year-old kid on a murder charge. And uh, David not only had two hands behind his back, but uh, uh, tied behind his back, but he was being hit over the head with an anvil. So uh, there was no hope that he was going to get off on this charge. Willie's lawyer was um, somewhat better, but uh, Willie's lawyer didn't do any work on the case either. Right, right. I think I think that's sort of what I was referring to, not that they were like these free attorneys, but a lot of them get appointed to these cases, but it's not their most important thing to do. Um, <laughs> All they're doing is making a living. Right. That's it? Yeah. Uh, they don't. I mean, the case itself, the individual case itself, is it, it's almost irrelevant. Yeah, and that's kind of the. How do you feel, David, about the justice system now? In this, at this point in your life, if someone was to say to you, "Is justice fair in the U.S.?" How would you respond? Well, so my response would be, you know, in terms of the criminal justice system, in terms of whether it's fair or not. I would say it depends, right? It depends on the individual, right? So if you're an individual who has the resources to, let's say, for example, you know, hire a competent attorney, which, believe it or not, it really, really helps in the court of law, um, whether it's through reputation or legal maneuvering and that sort of thing. I think it's important that you have proper legal representation, at least someone who's going to fight for you to the, to, to the very end. So, you know, for example, like someone like me who couldn't afford legal representation, I had to rely on court-appointed um, assistance, right? right. It's not that, and that's not necessarily all, you know, what it's cracked, cracked up to be, as maybe the public would, would believe, because what, sometimes what these, uh, these court-appointed attorneys do is they do what they would call the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is representing someone who and, and is doing as much as they can but as little as they can at the same time, while making sure they satisfy the legal requirements of the New York State Constitution and the federal Constitution. So that's what some of these court appointed attorneys do. So as someone like me, um, as far as the system in general is concerned, I would like to believe that we have a fair criminal justice system. But again, reality doesn't necessarily dictate that based on circumstances and based on my past and previous history. So. I would have to say that I'm, I'm sort of a mix. I don't mean to be sort of um, 
sort of been a gray area as far as that's concerned, but I'm sort of a mixed bag in terms of describing the criminal justice system as it presently constituted. How was it for you and your family? Uh, you spoke about your mother. Um, did your family and everybody stick behind you, and did you have friends, or did they sort of kind of not believe you, or where did it stand? So for me, um, look, there's a, approximately 55,000, at least at the time of my exoneration, there are approximately 55,000 inmates in the New York State Department of Correction, okay? So I'd like to say that me personally, I was one of the most fortunate ones only because I had my family to support me from the very beginning until the very end. And so, for instance, my mom, for example, um, you know, uh, during my arraignment of this particular crime, she had asked me one question. She had asked me, she said, David, did you commit this crime? I said, no, Ma, I did not. And that question never came up again. So as a result, and knowing that I had my mom in my corner, that, you know, at least provided for me a sense of relief, knowing that my mom, the very person who I had to somehow convince that I didn't commit this particular crime, believed in the fact that I didn't. And so that was very huge for someone like me, and I appreciated that. So what that particularly did, moving forward is it catapulted me into a position where I eventually knew that, you know what, my mind believes in me, so no matter what happens here on out, not necessarily that I will be fine with it, but I would know that my mom believed in what I had to say to her, and she believed in the fact that I told her that I did not commit this particular crime, and she respected that, and she believed me, and that was important to me. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it would be. Uh, I can, so... How did the um, exoneration happen? How did you get it to uh, Ken Thompson, who was the DA at the time? Uh, how, how do you make someone aware, uh, a district attorney, and also make them believe and take on the case and help you through it? Because um, there's so many of these out here, and there's so, they've got so much of a job to do as it is. How did it, how did it work for you? Well, that's a huge question that's actually <laughs> taken up in book freeing David McCallum. But uh, at the same time, uh, remember that Ken Thompson was only a uh, – sorry, he only won office, uh, the district attorney's office, in uh, 2013. And we started with David's case in 2004. <clears throat> so uh, Ken Thompson was the last step. Uh, all the way in between, uh, there were two uh, basic elements. One was to follow the legal trail, and in that we had uh, Oscar Michelin uh, from New York, uh, from Cuomo LLC. We had um, Steve Driven, one of the most famous uh, wrongful conviction people in the United States uh, from Northwestern, and Laura Cohen, uh, who worked at Rutgers, uh, these were top-flight people, and the reason they were on this case was that uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter was so highly respected and raised so much money for innocence projects all over. So uh, the, the second uh, uh, level, or the, the second thing that you have to have going for you is publicity. But with Reuben, uh, you know, he could call a, um, uh, a press conference, uh, he was constantly going around giving speeches and being seen, and he could mention things. But his um, worry was that if you didn't get media in a um, a really well-coordinated effort, uh, that it was more than one or two stories, uh, then all that media stuff would be wasted. And so uh, we started putting together things that would be would pay off down the line, not just one TV appearance uh, that uh, David had early on um, with uh, My Nine News in New York. It was a great uh, thing. It was it was what it was about 2005, maybe 2006 at the latest. It, it really was an effective piece, but it just was frittered away the power of it because uh, nothing followed up with it. So we learned that lesson. And by the time um, David was uh, uh, on the verge of being um, uh, released from prison, and I, I would say this began around the year 2012, 
13. Uh, more and more stories were coming out, the New York Times, the Daily News, uh, and there was a sense, we had a sense now that, that any time uh, we wanted to get a story out there, uh, we would be able to do that. And at the same time, the legal process was advancing. We had so many setbacks, so many. Uh, we would go into court thinking we had such a phenomenal uh, 440, uh, which is the kind of uh, bringing a, a, a motion to court to reopen the case. Oh, we thought we had such great stuff. And the judge, the judge who was ruling on the case was completely prejudiced against us. Uh, so uh, you had to be willing to, like David, to face setbacks and you had to take your anger and uh, uh, express it and then just go on and keep going. So again, you had the legal and the publicity, and each case is different. Uh, I wish it was a formula, but it's not. That's the way David's case worked. And so, and what's your opinion now, because working on that side of it, of, of, of helping people that are convicted, innocently or by false confessions, how do you, what's your take on the justice system in the U.S.? Um, you know, that it's a very big question, and uh, I think there are really good people everywhere in all aspects of the system, whether they be judges, prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys, police. The trouble is that there are um, some rogue people, rogue prosecutors and um, fairly cruel judges and police who we know um, resort to violence and uh, a number of other unsavory tactics. Uh, the problem is not that we have wrongful convictions because they have to happen. It's just a, a mathematical certainty that out of, every, out of so many convictions, uh, with 2.3 million people in the prisons right now, with so many convictions, there are going to be thousands of wrongful convictions. The problem is the system that is designed to prevent this and to overturn it. The, the entire um, appeal system, to me, is a rubber stamp. Uh, most of these appeals courts really don't look closely at the case. They want to be able to say that it's a good conviction. And unless they're given stunning evidence, really sometimes impossible evidence, uh, then they are um, not inclined to overturn, especially on constitutional issues. From my, it, it, this to me is the worst part of the American justice system that the Constitution of the United States is routinely ignored for the convenience of prosecutors and police who've done a bad job in having put a, a person wrongly behind uh, bars for perhaps the remainder of his life. So, so David, how do you feel now? Uh, how is life for you now that you're out? Um, and what's going on for you? Well, for me, life um, right now is obviously great. So, so when I'm sometimes asked this particular question, I have to sort of do a compare and contrast, right? So when I compare my life now as opposed to what it was during my incarceration, I have to take the last. I mean, you know, I mean, the former that is. I have to say that my life pretty is pretty substantial now, you know. But at the same time, it's not without any particular challenges. So there's always going to be challenges, I would say, because. You know, during that amount of time in prison, um, you would have to believe that one would sometimes uh, somehow become what some would call institutionalized. And, you know, what I mean by that is having to rid yourself of some of the everyday prison prisons that I had to experience during the course of my time, you know. So when you're, now that I'm out on the outside, it's, it's hard to shake. But at the same time, I have no real complaints about that only because it's an important issue for me to sort of overcome or, at the very least, continue to navigate all the problems and circumstances that I'm faced with today. So I've made a decision to do that, right, because I know what the alternative feels like. It is not a very good feeling at all. And so for me, being on the outside, um, I have my complaints, obviously, but at the same time, I also understand 
particularly when I do the campaign contrast as to what things were and how life were when I was incarcerated, I understand that there was a huge difference um, in terms of being incarcerated and being in what they want to call the free society. So for me, uh, so when I had problems, for example, there's people that I can talk to, not necessarily on the telephone, as I did many times with Ken, Gary Dolan, my attorney, Oscar Michelin, and so forth, Mary Ellen, obviously, excuse me, but I was also able to, now I'm also able now to speak to people face to face. And that's a huge difference in terms of being incarcerated when you're very, very limited. Yeah. So what would be... Oh, let David tell you what he's doing in his life right now. (laughs) (laughs) Sure, yes. Very good question. So, you know, what I'm doing now, for example, is I work for the Manhattan Legal Aid Society. So I work for the Juvenile Rights Division. And so some of the work that I do now is stemmed around young people, for example, foster care, and people and young children who's being neglected by their particular foster parents or biological parents and that sort of thing. So that kind of work, you know, gives me comfort. And what I also do is I do public speaking. So one of the things that I promised myself that I would do, that I promised others, of course, if I was ever released from prison, that I would do public speaking. And the sort of public speaking that I would like to do and that I am doing currently is speaking about wrongful convictions, right, but also speaking about wrongful convictions, wrongful convictions in a way that also supersedes or encounters other issues that affect our society. So when I do these particular talks, whether it's at juvenile rights detention centers, um, I just speak to lawyers, for example, in the criminal defense field, um, I get a sort of satisfaction because I feel like not necessarily that I'm uh, fulfilling a promise that I made to many others, and of course including myself, but it's also making sure that I understand and I express to people in, that don't have a voice at the particular moment that I under, let them know that there are people, um, you know, who are suffering in our society who needs to be heard. And I feel like in some ways I'd like to think, at least, that I speak for these people. And, and David, what would be the um, thing that you would tell someone that's young who's having problem with, the uh, the justice system, the legal system, or they they've gotten in trouble. What's the thing you tell them? Well, I will tell them that you know life is never over. I mean, sometimes we look at some of the bad deeds that we do or may not do, or may that uh, we are falsely accused of doing. But that's not the very end. Um, I believe in redemption. I think redemption is very important to particularly someone like me. And one of the examples that I can use is there was many times that I could have given up on myself and my circumstances based on what I was being charged with, based on what I was faced with in terms of being in prison for the rest of my very life, natural life, that is. So I want to say to people like that, no matter what the circumstances are, when things look bleak, there's an opportunity, how bleak it may seem, but there is an opportunity. And sometimes that's all we really need is the opportunity to express ourselves in a way that gets somebody's attention. So for someone like me to be able to get the attention of Ken Clancy, which in my opinion facilitated this whole process in terms of my path to freedom, that can't be overlooked, and it certainly can't be taken for granted. Because those are, uh, in some ways, the missed opportunities that we have or that we don't take advantage of that end up costing some people sometimes not necessarily their natural life, but their literal lives. So the example here is to not take anything for granted and to explore every option that you possibly can to make sure that you give yourself an opportunity to get a fair result. Right. That's what I like to think I did in my situation. Do you have any leftover anger from being put away to the, uh, you know, for the officers that did it back in, in, in the uh, 80s? Well, I think for me, anger can be associated in many different ways. I mean, I don't, certainly I don't blame someone for being very angry about what happened to them, him or her, for example, because they're all women who unfortunately are wrongfully convicted as well, who don't get the notoriety that I think their particular cases deserve. But I think for someone like me to be angry would be absolutely a waste of time, right? And the reason why it would be a waste of time for someone like me is I'm in my late 40s now, and I was in my mid-40s when I was exonerated. And for me to harbor that sort of grievance, because sometimes if we don't channel our anger 
properly, uh, we could end up doing something that we will truly regret later on. So I was never going to put myself in that position. So what I did when I was in prison, for example, I decided to use my anger in a positive way. So whether, whether that was helping other prisoners with work, legal work, or whatever the case may be, that's what I wanted to decide to do. I wanted, I did not want, and I was very determined about this, I did not want these people to think, when I say these people, I'm talking about the system in general, to think that, you know, whether this is not the person that they think I am, all right, because I'm a better person than what they were falsely accusing me of doing, right? And that was my motivation. And my also motivation was my family, you know, who stood behind me from the very beginning until the very, very end. And I will always, always appreciate that. So that's, you know, I've found motivation from many different angles of life, and I could not describe this any better than what, you know, the motivation of us with my oldest sister, who is disabled, who has been bedridden her entire life. So whenever things got bad in prison for someone like me, I always knew there was someone on the outside, my sister, who was going through some stuff that she didn't particularly ask for, that, you know, that was an inspiration for me to continue to fight for what I believed in. So, Ken, so if people want to get involved and help out and uh, contribute something for um, the cause of helping with false confessions or wrongly convicted people, what, what do you suggest? Well, I, I, I would like to just say in uh, parting there with David, uh, he, he's a father, uh, which is a huge thing. He's got a beautiful little daughter, Quinn, so I, I just wanted to put the plug in there because uh, I think he's is to say so, but I'm sure that's the most important thing in his life right now, or she's the most important thing. No doubt. Yeah. Um, as to getting involved, I think um, uh, someone in a particular area, uh, if you know somebody who's dealing with a wrongful conviction, if, uh, if there's someone in your family, if there's someone uh, amongst your friendship group, uh, if uh, you know someone in the area, that and and you want to show concern, you can always contact uh, the people who are running the show around that person and uh, volunteer help. We're getting a lot of that right now on the Burns Raffay case, uh, more so than uh, I even know what to do with. But the, these people pledge money and they've also pledged work, labor, and um, those are the people in the end who uh, will get you out of prison. And you, uh, as a volunteer, can participate in what I think is uh, second to childbirth, uh, perhaps the most wonderful experience in society, and that is to help someone's life be reborn uh, back into society. Uh, it's certainly, there's nothing wrong. You can't say a negative thing about work like that if you're working on the right side and you're working for the truth. So uh, there are many ways of getting involved, um, and it just depends on where you are and uh, who you know. Right. Well, Ken, this has been amazing. And, David, um, the book, of course, is called Freeing David McCullum. And um, um, I want to thank you both for being on the show. And, uh, David, uh, thank you for um, sharing with us uh, some of your story. Oh, wow, thank you. It's, it's been my pleasure to do so because I think for me, um, you know, during the conclusion of my incarceration, I made a promise to myself and other prison, prisoners who I left behind that when I ever got the opportunity to get out of prison, that I would try to create a platform, to, you know, for their particular voices to be heard in ways that they cannot do for themselves. And I would like to think that I've accomplished that and will continue to accomplish that. So, for example, I know that Ken, for example, just mentioned, you know, you know, the, the Rafay Burns case. And I had the privilege, actually, of, of meeting um, uh, actually Rafay in person and having the opportunity to sit down and speak to him for uh, a few hours was sort of like a, a, in some ways, a sort of lifelong dream for someone like myself because here it is, you deal with someone else who's being falsely accused of a crime and wrongfully convicted, the whole case involves what they would call a false confession. And I would, and I would say to the audience, for example, any time you know, we hear false confessions, it's an international issue. So here I am in the United States, for example, and Mr. Lassay is in, uh, you know, uh, the state of Washington. And, you know, uh, this is an international problem. And if this is not a, a problem, 
you know, involved in one segment of North America. It's, it actually involves the entire North America, and the Rafe case is a perfect example of that. So I just want to make sure that I bring, and Lisa, at least at the very least, mention the fact that there are many, many individuals like Rafe, like the people of faith who are suffering in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And I think it's important for the society to understand that, again, based on what we talked about earlier about um, when we hear the word confessions, we, the automatic assumption is that the person committed the crime. But I think when we if, uh, take a very closer examination of the particular case or the confessions in general, or specifically, we will, I guess, determine, so at least come to the you know the determination that that is not fact, that is not the fact, you know. Of what happened. So yeah. I think that's important for all of us to understand. Thank oh, you. It totally is. Well, uh, thank you both again. Thank you, Al. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Al Warren. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.